let's just jump to it. Who do you think had the most impressive day or who looked the best, who looked best in rhythm uh, on Saturday, Dustin, to you? Out of the quarterbacks? Yep, out of the, all the quarterbacks that we saw. We saw even walk on, but the main three that we got to see. I mean, if you want me to be honest, out of the three quarterbacks I watched, the, the guy who had the best day was me. Hey guys, it's Terrence Nan. You're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. Go Dose. Hey, what's up? This is Peter Ward, aka E Dub in the house. So we're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. Go live, go nose. Hi, this is Charlie Ward, and you're listening to Hear the Spear. Go nose. This is Terrell Fuckley. You're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. No bloody. But perhaps better known as the greatest corner to ever step on a football field, Deion Primetime Sanders. The great Deion Sanders, my brother. What's going on, man? I could, I could wake up to that greedy every day, man. That was awesome. Hello, those fans. This is former Seminole Derek Brooks, and you're listening to Hear the Spear, presented to you by No Game Day. James Wilder Jr. What's going on, James? Thanks for having me on. SSOD, Florida State or Die, and go no. William Barnon Floyd. Gentlemen, what's up? What is happening, guys? This is Logan Robinson from Here the Spear, presented to you by Noel Game Day. We are here on the Wednesday evening, not a Thursday evening, but a Wednesday evening. We've got a lot to talk about. Me and Dustin spent the whole morning on Saturday at Florida State's first spring scrimmage under Mike Norvell, open to the public. We have a lot to discuss during that, a lot of notes there. I think Dustin wrote at least about 2,000 words on this whole scrimmage. So we've got a lot to kind of go through here and discuss. Along with that, we are going to jump into a big preview of Florida State versus number one seed Michigan. Uh, this game is going to be held on Sunday at 5 o'clock, so we're giving you guys enough days to listen to this podcast and preview with Austin. He gives the best insight around Florida State basketball, so I'm um, happy to have him on here to help us do this. As always, you can listen to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify. If you're on YouTube right now, feel free to hit the like button. It really does help us uh, get this out to more FSU fans. If you're on iTunes or Spotify, hit that subscribe button. So then whenever we upload an episode, it gets notified to your phone without any kind of, uh, 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 of us slowing down this podcast. Let's jump into it. Let me introduce Nate Greer, my, our lead recruiting insider at nolgamemade.com. Austin Vizi, our lead basketball writer at NG. And also at the bottom, Dustin smiling. He's in a good mood. He just got offered a new job. Dustin Lewis is in the house. Don't lead say that. Editor. It's not. A, it's not official. I like, don't put that on the air. I'm doing it so if we, we can blow it, you know. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, what's going on, gentlemen? Good to see you on this Wednesday night. We haven't had a Wednesday night in a little while. This is a day to hate Michigan. It's a great week to hate Michigan. There's. It's always a great week though, but definitely in particular to this one, it's definitely strong. That we hate Michigan altogether. Happy to be here. Beyond happy. Nate, how are you feeling? Great. How, how are you and Dustin doing after y'all went at it earlier this week in the text messages? We didn't go at it. I mean, I, I wouldn't really Dustin said he Dustin <laughs> said that he thought that you're Dustin said he thought that you were coming on to him a little too hard there, like just getting after him. No, I was just saying it's about time he did some some work, you know. <laughs> If we were talk, talking about, you know, going out there and putting in work, you know, it's great to see. <laughs> you know, thank, thank you, Dustin. Great job. That's all I said. And then, I'm getting, he got, then he got my all, Boy Scout badges. Then he got all defensive and was trying to be, you know, a Tony Tough guy, you know? Yeah. I, w- I wouldn't say that's how it went. I'm sure you'll release the text. I mean, you've done it before on social media. I'm sure they'll make their way out there. Well, you know, th- that's only for – for for twats so. <laughs> i'd be interested oh. to see what category i fall under uh, don't say it don't, don't say yeah it. don't say it yeah say no. It. <laughs> <laughs> no but i appreciate everybody if you're watching us live definitely feel free to throw in uh, a few questions here and there we'll try to answer as many as we can as we go through the show uh but the main focus tonight is scrimmage and march madness with fsu first michigan let's jump into the first topic of the night obviously florida state we just talked about it Florida State held an open scrimmage. It was kind of late there by the staff. I didn't even know this was going on until Dustin like texted me. I woke up in the morning and it was like, hey, we're getting up early in the morning. See you there. Um, Florida State, Norvell, what they're doing is they're allowing 
uh, fans, whoever, open the public and even the media to be there to uh, kind of view the scrimmages going on. It's a smart. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's smart. Nate was like, "That's a smart idea," and we I talked about it on the Mark on Mark Rogers show earlier tonight, like how smart that is of utilizing, uh, you know, the strictness of what the NCAA is doing right now with the visiting situation and allowing these guys to come in watch practice and then also Dustin which we thought was pretty interesting the PA announcer talked about it on on Saturday morning that's allowing uh, people to come down and take pictures inside Doak which ended up being a big thing for recruits and high school athletes to go down there and take pictures and it was all over social media so this is kind of just a smart play here by Mike Norvell and staff yeah I mean absolutely because you know we'll get into it but you had recruits Come last weekend, you're going to have some guys come up this weekend. Um, we'll see if Florida State holds a scrimmage the Saturday after that. But then you're also going to have an influx of visitors on April 10th for the spring game. So, I mean, this is really just allowing Florida State to get as many guys in as possible to be able to check out the the coaches in action, really, and also the team. And, you know, from, from what I heard from some guys that I talked to, they were very impressed with what they saw on Saturday and – they love getting a chance to check out the campus and there's a couple that are going to be back this weekend for the spring game. And we'll get, you know, we'll get a little bit more into that later on. Yeah, I know. What do you think Nate about that? You know, taking advantage, you talked about in the group chat whenever we got news that it was going to be open to the public. How do you think Norvell's really taking advantage of that and recruiting wise? Uh, kind of like you said, I, th- I think it's, you know, it's taking, taking advantage of, uh, of, of the role and taking advantage of, of the game. Uh, and, you know, Fort State is not the only school that's going to do that or is doing that. So I, I think that it's just, um, again, it, it's an attention to detail, knowing that you can utilize opening up your, your, your practice or your scrimmage, whatever you want to call it, to, to fans, and which allows recruits to come, sit in the stands, and, and get, a, get a view of what's going on and finally kind of see some things, how the practices are ran, how – how things are unfolding, if it's really matching what the coaches are saying, uh, gives these recruits some validation. And like, like Dustin, I talked to a couple of guys who were, you know, simply blown away about the, you know, s- some progress, but on- well, mainly just the way that the coaches connect with the players and, and how much they're, they're really pushing them in a practice and in a the scrimmage setting. So they were – smart to take advantage of, of, of this and you know I'm not going to be surprised if we see quite a lot of schools you know do it before spring is over but it's yeah. good for Florida State to set the precedent yep I mean you know for you know some of these guys that are being heavily recruited right now haven't taken visits you know yeah this is not a visit but kind of kind of is a visit. So it, it, it gives Florida State first dibs on 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 an opportunity to impress these guys. So, and someone wrote in here on, in our Twitch chat. You know, some states like California, they have no, they can't do this at all. You know, right. due yeah. to their restrictions and everything. So, I mean, I know there's probably more of states that can do this, but some like, you know, that that side of the country really is, and there's a lot of more strict. Uh, protocol for letting people into stands and even in the bigger establishments and amount of people you can have. So uh, this is where Mike Norvell and staff and being in Florida, they can take full advantage on it and get recruits into Doe Campbell stadium, get them to the campus even um, and show them, you know, a, a scrimmage, what a practice looks like show like the organization. I think that's something Mike Norvell probably wants to show off is how organized yeah. it is. Cause that's something me and Dustin realized right off the bat, they were out there early they got out there early for the scrimmage. Mike Norvell was ready, juiced up, ready to go. And it was right to it. I, there wasn't many breaks. You know, when we saw breaks going on, it was breaks for maybe position groups, but you're still running, you're still running spring uh, special teams, right? Dustin, you're still running special teams drills while you're taking uh, maybe a, a max of a five minute break. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it, it was extremely organized. And when we were out there, you know, I compared it to that that Saturday night live event that Florida state had under Taggart a couple years ago, where I swear the event started like an hour and a half or two hours later than it was scheduled to. I mean, this was a scrimmage scheduled for 10 in the morning. And when we got there, there's already guys out on the field. I think the kickers and like long snappers and by, you know, 
nine forty or so, nine forty five, the rest of the team was out there already going through warm ups and I mean they even started they started going through goal line before it was even ten o'clock. <laughs> so I mean they got started early, technically. Mm-hmm. And I mean like you like you said, like everything was very sound. The players were dialed in the whole practice and I mean even even the littlest things were on Mike Norvell's mind. Like the the sideline was you know, a couple yards on the field at one point, and Mike Norvell turns around and he's screaming at him, get back on the sideline. Coaches, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all letting him uh, on the field? Um, it was it was a good experience overall. I'm excited for this Saturday. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So kind of going more in detail, we just wanted to go over, you know, the whole feeling of it. But uh, just going off of like just first – takes on it, Dustin. I know the rest of the guys can discuss it too on these players, but we've, we've heard a lot of, you know, the, the winner of the day, I guess we can just start off with, you know, the winner of the day to me and my take is uh, Trishon Ward. We heard so much about him during the tour of duty. We heard about him last year. The thing hindering him was just his mental game, you know, getting down the playbook, little things like that. But He's out there, and it seemed like he, you know, he was really in rhythm on that offense, Dustin. To me, uh, he had the best vision out there. I know Corbin and uh, DJ were out there too. Uh, obviously, Toa Philly. Uh, you had Don- Deontay Sheffield mixed in there, but you know, the winner of this day overall, both on offense and defense, uh, had to be Treshawn Ward for me. He had an outstanding day. He had the best vision. He was able to shut off uh, uh, defenders. And I thought he hit the holes right. And he had actually a few goal line touches too, uh, which ended up in six. So uh, to me, Treshawn Ward won that day. Yeah, I completely agree. And I mean, that that goes back to what we've heard since really the tour of duty. I mean, he was really impressive there. And that's just continued now onto the field. And I mean, like you said, Logan, he was extremely impressive. He was definitely the standout player on, on either side of the day. And I mean, there were a couple other, a couple other guys that, had pretty pretty good performances as well, but I mean, yeah, he got to the outside a couple of times. Um, he he broke a tackle by Brendan Gant, then got like a fifty yards before Jay was able to push him out, and he broke he broke one off the left side that was like thirty for a touchdown. He just outran everybody, and then like Logan said, he scored twice inside on the goal line, so he had three touchdowns. I mean, well over a hundred yards if, if you're thinking yard wise and. He was the best running back uh, by far. I, I, I was talking with the, you know, the guys that are over on Concord Talk, and we were talking about him, you know, it, and you're know, kind of leading up to your spring about, you know, maybe Trishan being a guy who takes carries this year, and the fact that you know there's a belief that he's maybe the, the most natural runner that's on the roster, and you know whether that's coach speak or or whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I think we're starting to see maybe some validity there. You know, the, the small, the small amount of carries he got in the bowl game um, against Arizona State. You know, he he produced uh, the few he got last year. You know, he's produced. So I think that you know, the like like Logan said, the biggest knock for him has been the you know, the the mental part of the game. You know, le- learning you know, his role and what he should be doing inside the offense. Um, you know, if that comes together, you know, he, he's the guy who can, you know, FSU is running back is going to be rotational, but he's going to be a guy who's going to be in the rotation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, he, re- he really did win that game, uh, win the, uh, the scrimmage overall. If I'm looking at maybe defensively most impressive, and we'll probably agree on this, Dustin, was Jamie Robinson, not just mainly just of his physicality, which it showed off really quickly on the hits he was bringing, but also his physicality on the line, jamming up uh, whoever was, uh, he was on. And also in coverage, too. I was watching him in goal line, uh, and he, uh, all of the reps that he had there, uh, there was no way the quarterback was going to find a receiver on him. So uh, by far, I think Jamie Robinson won that day. wasn't some crazy uh, performance, but – to see a guy come in in great shape, look really nice out there, um, and and come from another school uh, is nice to see. Uh, yeah, before, I mean, before, you know, my, my only comment there is, you know, not being there, but hearing that it was back and forth. You know, one side didn't dominate the other, which is what we, we've heard, especially mm-hmm. last year. You know, so it's good to hear that both sides had, had, had some victories. 
you know, you know, each side was able to to push and produce against each other. So that you know, that's good to see that balance there. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, you know, as, as Logan would say, that that's a big cat. I mean, when whenever he walked out onto the field, we were looking over there, and and I was looking at the roster, and I was like, that's Jamie Robinson. I mean, that that's a big dude to to be playing safety, and he came up and delivered. It might have been the biggest hit of the day, but I mean, it was a big pop on Cam McDonald, and when McDonald wasn't expecting it, and Credit to McDonald, he held on to the ball, but I mean the whole the whole defense erupted whenever he did that. The coaches were freaking out. He he had a really nice day. And I mean that that entire secondary, there's some players out there. Jarvis Brownley did a couple things. Darian Jones, had, I believe he had an interception, but I think they threw a penalty on it. But I mean it it wasn't a penalty, so don't worry about that. I, I was there. <laughs> no, it wasn't bad. ACC refs, man. Yeah, I got the ACC refs out there. Somehow they were able to get them in there, but yeah, no, uh, Jamie Robinson by far on the defensive side of the ball and definitely the DB unit had the most. Um, he just came in well prepared and, you know, he was the starting he was the starting uh, guy out there. They just threw him out there right off the bat. And it's nice to see a guy that's able to get down the playbook for whatever it's at right now. I know it's the spring, so it's going to be pretty light, but you're still able to go out there and perform like that and play good and be unlocked down on your receivers and be able to jam up on the line, play physical, lay a big hit on Cameron McDonald, who's a big cat that's a big that's a pretty good sized uh guy and he's you know he's a tight end uh it, it was nice to see that kind of physicality to start off with because he did say in his press conference when he arrived you know he made a pretty bold statement that he wants to be the hardest hitting physical guy that at what a star nickel whatever he's at he wants to be the most physical guy but you know you instantly think about like a lamarcus joiner type so he's he's got some work to do for that but it's good to show off right in the first spring game you know being physical <laughs> Or spring think, spring scrimmage, I should say. I, I think in October we're going to look at that as a major W for those for the, the coaching staff getting him in. You know, I, I think we're going to see a guy who's I really project him to be a starter, and I think that he's going to really play well for Florida State. I agree, and I mean, I don't know if you echo this sentiment, Logan, but the second the second most player or second most impressive player that I saw on Saturday on defense was. Baby and love it inside the interior of that defensive line. I mean, there were there were a couple times where they were running goal line where he just absolutely stuffed the offense. I think Florida State ran about seven plays or so down on the goal line with I believe it was mm-hmm. Milton in at quarterback, if I remember it correctly. And they didn't they didn't score on a single play. And there was two times back to back where Love it just came right up the middle and got a tackle for loss. If he keeps doing stuff like that, I mean, he's he's going to be the next dominant defensive tackle at Florida State. So, I mean, that's another really good transfer addition that Florida State was able to get last year. Mm-hmm. Going back to the defensive side, you, you named Fabian Lovett. Uh, maybe some guys that we weren't expecting to see flash out, uh, but these are always – this is the best part. You get to see who, who's ready to turn the turn it around a little bit. Quashawn Fuller, I thought, had a pretty solid day getting after the quarterback. He was in the backfield a ton. Griffiths was too, but I think Quashawn Fuller was a little bit ahead of him, but Fuller was able to get into the backfield, even was able to stuff the run quite a few times too. Uh, I thought he had an impressive day, a guy that um, you know, has a lot of a lot of the fans and people covering have been curious on what his future entails, and you know, he, he he goes from Florida, he goes to FSU. Like, what, what is how much playing time he's going to get in his career? I think this was a nice start for him during the spring, and I'm sure um, Odell was happy with his performance during the spring uh, scrimmage because Dustin, he was he was all over the place. I was even telling you, I mean, that's Fuller back there, man. He's he's already back there at the quarterback, and I think he had one or two sacks at least. Oh, I agree, and he was another guy that I noted um, during that live thread that we were doing that he he had a really big hit. On someone, uh-huh. I don't, uh, I don't you remember. Had it. it was to oh, was it was it Toa Billy? Was it now? Nah, who was? It? It's in the note. It's in the. Uh, I don't know if I put down the name of who he hit. It might have been. I don't know if Corbin was already out of the scrimmage by then. It was a running back though, and he he lit him up. So, and that was one of the bigger hits of the day too. It might have been. It might have been top five. Corbin. Top five. Yeah, but yeah. He had, he had a really good day, and he was actually getting reps um with the ones like subbing in. Whereas Griffiths and uh, Griffiths, who had a decent day, and 
Also, Deontay Williams had a sack as well. They were running more against the twos and scout team type guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, going through here, let's – You know, for Florida, for Florida State, if if Fuller can take that next step, you know, that they need that, you know, significantly for the depth of, the, of that defensive line. So, if he can put it together, whether he's, you know, sliding into a three or lining up as a fox – you know, Florida State needs that, so that's good to hear. If he can start to put it together and take that next step for the for for Florida State, and you got to think that you know, also they've got Dennis Briggs right now, you know, on the interior defensive line. But I mean, to me, he's really a guy that you can flex to really any position on that defensive line. So if needed, they can put him on the outside too to take up some snaps. Absolutely, I know there's going to be some question marks, and I'm sure people are listening right now in their cars and like, what. Well, Let's talk quarterbacks. What's going on with the quarterbacks? You know, Mackenzie Milt, we get to see him in first under a, a scream, a spring scrimmage. Let's talk some quarterbacks. So let's talk some quarterbacks. Why don't we? So let's just jump to it. Who do you think had the most impressive day or who looked the best, who looked best in rhythm uh, on Saturday, Dustin, to you? Out of the quarterbacks? Yep. Out of the, all the quarterbacks that we saw, we saw even walk on, but the main three that we got to see. I mean, if you want me to be honest, out of the three quarterbacks I watched, the, the guy who had the best day was Tate Rodemaker, without a doubt. But at the same time, Tate Rodemaker wasn't going up against that first def- or first team defense the majority of the time. But, I mean, man, he, he had a really nice day. I mean, there was one point towards the end of the scrimmage, he had um, Malik McClain on a fade route, and McClain just got by the entire defense. He was wide open. And Rodemaker hit him with a dart in stride. I mean, that was a touchdown. There was another play where he hit um, Kentron for a, t- a touchdown. He had a nice throw that Ontario Wilson was able to make a, a really acrobatic catch on. It was it was a really nice day for him. But, you know, going over to Milton, you know, he was a little bit off in rhythm, maybe throwing-wise. But I'm not really worried about that because he's a guy who, you know, has proven what he can do at the college level at UCF. To me, the main thing I wanted to see in this scrimmage was his mobility. And there were a couple times where he rolled out of the pocket, and, I mean, he looked he looked fine. I remember you said before, like, he had a little bit of a limp in, in his run, or maybe it looked a little awkward. But it looked completely natural. I remember the pocket the pocket uh, broke down at one point. He had to scramble up, and he, he was comfortable enough to make a little juke cut on a defender. I thought mobility, mobility wise, he looked good, and it's really just going to come down to continuing to build chemistry with those receivers, learning the playbook, and you know, Logan, I think in a couple of days when we get out there, he's going to put on a show. Yeah, no, you could definitely tell he's still got some chemistry to work with. Definitely his receivers. Um, there were some low balls even during warmups. You know, there's just little things that are hindering him at the first beginning but you know you're learning a whole new playbook and as a quarterback it's not going to be easy whatsoever and Mike Norvell and Dillingham like to run a lot of different styled plays um, and so that, it's not really a shocker there but at least athleticism wise you know you, you could see it. it's just a it's an awkward run we were told about this it shouldn't be a sh- we shouldn't be all freaking out but it is kind of like an awkward run of him but he's running at 100% really. he's, yeah he's running at 100% that is fine um but it's yeah not like think, a noticeable awkward or anything but yeah. another thing you know he was even when he wasn't getting reps i mean he was locked in for that entire scrimmage i think you know mike norvell was standing off towards the sideline a little bit on on the offensive side and throughout the entire scrimmage four or five times we watched mckenzie milton walk over to mike norvell and sit there and have you know extended conversations with him probably just you know, asking about what he could have done. To, I don't know. I don't know. Either way, they're having some conversations, a lot of them. And I don't know. I think that can only be better for them getting their chemistry down as coach and player as they move through the spring because they're still learning each other. Yeah, no, they most certainly are. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Tate Redmaker was out there for a majority of the time. I didn't I didn't know if they were ever going to take him off the field for <laughs> – I didn't know. For, we didn't. We kept on asking each other, is this <clears throat> Milton's last series? Is this Jordan Travis's? Because Roadmaker was out there for so dang long. He needs uh, it. Yeah, he needed it. But going back to Roadmaker, too, nice plays on the field, but his composure was a lot nice. It was nicer than 
from what I got to see in the stands whenever he was put in. Obviously, it's, as a true freshman going to a college game, that's tough. But, I mean, you're coming to Florida State and you're playing an opponent of that nature. You should be okay to be fine. Uh, his composure and there's been, you know, there's a lot of maybe some personality things that – uh, we were hearing during uh, this offseason that he's been working on, and it did show on Saturday. He came prepared. He played well. And played. Had, I think he had the biggest plays for uh, with him and connecting with wide receivers. I remember, I remember McLean's big uh, catch and run. I forgot about the one he threw to – he hit Jordan Young on that post route where Young was wide open in the middle of the defense, and he caught it, juked a DB, and, I mean, it would have been a touchdown if it was a real game. Yeah. Uh, I'm talent's never been his issue. So no, never now. Yeah. And I mean, he's still got a lot of things to work on. Like um, he probably got sacked four or five times during that scrimmage. So really to me, he needs to work on throwing the ball away, getting the ball out quicker. And, you know, also just read the defense. He did have an interception, but it was a long, deep ball downfield. That was really just wide receiver and DB one-on-one. So I don't really, I don't really blame him for that. It was a 50, 50 ball. He took a shot, but you know, he's a, he's a redshirt freshman and we've talked about it before, but having Milton in that room to kind of learn from and guide him a little bit and keep him on the right path, that's only going to help him. And I mean, that's something we've heard this off season that he's really taken a step forward um, with his attitude. Mm-hmm. And the last one here, we haven't been able to talk about him, uh, but Jordan Travis, I mean, I, I thought that, it probably went one, two, and three. I, I don't know if there was – for me, it was really in between Jordan Travis and Tate Roadmaker um, just because Jordan Travis was facing f- first team and the first drive that they had, they went down their throats and scored on them and, and, and Jordan Travis threw a touchdown. Um, but, you know, there was some things that we've been looking for him to work on and it's really about his accuracy when throwing a little bit deeper down the field. I thought – he and I think it was the first drive where I don't think you saw it because you're having to type like 30,000 things in one minute. But there was a there was a nice touch pass uh, from him to Ontario Wilson off to the sideline over the shoulder. And it was gorgeous. It's only where Ontario Wilson could catch. It was also a phenomenal catch from Ontario, but it was a great pass to him where only the uh, wide receiver could get it. And Wilson for sure uh, brought it down. And that's where that drive just kept on cooking. Um, and, you know, with Jordan, you know, what, what do you guys think the biggest thing for him to work on during this spring is? What's the biggest thing? Being a consistent passer. You yeah, know, b- being able to push the f- ball down the field, but also, you know, hitting that 15 to 20 yard stuff in the middle of the field on a consistent basis. That's what opens up an offense. Um, you know, until he can prove that, you know, that, that that's going to be – what holds him back from being a starter, you know? Yeah. He, he had some chunk plays last year, um, but he also missed a ton, which, you know, cut the toe off the, off the offense. You know, when, when you are leaving all those plays out, out in the field, it's a lot of, a lot of missed points, a lot of missed opportunities. So, you know, for, for me, I want to see him just develop as, as a thrower. I agree with that. And, you know, also during the scrimmage, I just felt like he was tucking the ball down and and running too quickly. You know, he wasn't spending enough time um, reading the defense and finding the open man. He was like, all right, I got pressure on me. I'm going to tuck it down and and run, which I mean, that's that's his style. But at the same time, if he wants to be a quarterback, he's going to have to learn to deliver those throws under pressure and not always take it down for three, four yards. Yeah, I, that was something I was noting too. Is that I only saw maybe a just one or two plays where he had to tuck it. Um, and there he did was it. Nobody... I watched him do it for like three or four straight plays. I, I, I'd be interested to see, you know, when he starts to tuck it and run, you know, look, look downfield and see if those receivers open, you know. So, so is he not seeing that? You know, it, it, is his first thought is to, to run the ball when if you hold it for another half second, guys wide open and you, and you, you hit that guy. So, so that's what I need to see. Yeah. It's great. You pick up four or five yards, but you also miss an opportunity to put points on the board or hit, or hit a 50 yarder. So. Yeah. Uh, but that was practically uh, the quarterback room uh, to start off the scrimmage until I think Dante Lucas 
went down with an injury. I thought the offensive line was moving pretty well. I don't know about you, Dustin, but we were talking and I thought they were moving pretty solidly. I mean, they ran down that defense in that first drive. Uh, and then I believe the third drive, uh, the McKenzie Milton, I believe they didn't do much, but the, the first drive looked really nice. Were they able to have a run game and passing attack against the first team defense? Yeah, like you said, um, the offensive line, they looked pretty solid considering, you know, Devontae Love Taylor is going to miss the spring. And also, um, maybe on Johnson wasn't suited up on Saturday, um, probably for a minor injury or something. And then, yeah, they, they did pretty well. And then when they were down on that goal line, whenever Fabian Lovett made one of those plays that I mentioned earlier, just in that crowd of bodies, you know, uh, Lucas either got rolled up on or something. And he had to go off to the side. He, he missed the rest of the scrimmage. He was just kind of limping around. But, I mean, he looks like he's going to be okay. I don't think Mike Norvell mentioned him earlier today whenever he was talking about scrimmage injuries. So, you know, they're still they're still making progress. There's a lot of young guys on that offensive line. You know, uh, Robert Scott, he had some good battles out there with Jermaine Johnson. Johnson – beat him at least one time for a sack. But, I mean, you got to think of a redshirt freshman going up a, going up against a veteran pass rusher. That's just going to help his development moving forward. I mean, he's going to get those reps through the rest of the spring and in August before the season starts. I, he, I don't know if he's going to face many better edge rushers this college football season than the one that's on his team right now. Nope. Uh, let's see anything too more impressive. It was funny though, going back to the offensive line and getting to see, uh, coach Atkins, <laughs> we were, we were about to leave, uh, the stadium and be done, but, uh, coach Atkins and all the position group <laughs> coaches called their uh, players over, you know, for meetings before they went back in the locker room and, uh, coach Atkins had a nice little chat, had a nice little chat with the offensive linemen and about two minutes later, said get down up down so here we go <laughs> and spent about i don't know we left they could have kept on going but we <laughs> left. Were still we going. watched for about we watched for about five minutes um but i thought it was pretty funny to see coach atkins getting after him yeah i mean you know i said the offensive line they had a pretty good day but they they were still giving up too many sacks and there was one or two false start penalties and some other stuff that i'm sure you know atkins saw that he wasn't happy about yeah, he had a nice little chat with them, and then he made them all get in a circle and do up downs. The guys that couldn't do up downs were doing like air squats and and like sit ups, depending on whatever they could do. I mean, he worked them. We were stand, we were walking down the stairs, and we heard him start uh, doing doing it. And we turned around, and we're like, "Oh, we're gonna watch this." And I, that was the only position group that we saw get punished on the field. Everyone else went inside. So I mean, it just shows how high Atkins holds those guys in regard. You know, he has high expectations for them and he's, he set a bar. And if you don't, if you're not above that bar, you're doing up downs, I guess. And I, and I'm, and I'm happy for him that we got to have him on the field because I did get to hear him cuss out, uh, Estes poor Estes <laughs> poor Estes didn't know that they need to be huddled up and getting ready for the next series. But poor true freshman Estes uh, got, a, got a nice F-bomb from Coach Atkins uh, and uh, learned really quickly what it's like being in college ball or just being around uh, Coach Atkins and how that's <laughs> going to work. So uh, Tough love. Tough love, absolutely. You got to love it. I loved every bit of it. It's just part of football. Uh, but, uh, yeah, offensive line, I think wide receivers, uh, the guy that was out on the field the entire time, I felt like, I mean, he spent so much time on the field, was true freshman wide receiver Malik McLean. I kept on telling Dustin, is he getting off the field? Is he going to come off? He's He's been out here for so long. Is he in trouble? Is he having to get out a lot of reps? What's going on? A lot of plays. Does he not know the playbook? But as a true freshman, um, he was out there a ton and also made some plays with Roadmaker. Yeah, he was – he was outstanding. I mean, he was the best, in my opinion, he was the best wide receiver out there on Saturday. He he had the most catches out of any, out of anybody. He had that long play I mentioned up on the sideline earlier. And just there was a couple routes on the outside 
where he was quick enough to beat the DB. And he also has the size that he can use over there on the sideline to make tough catches. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to keep seeing him develop. He needs to keep adding to his frame. I mean, I would say he's a little small right now. If he's going to take some, some big hits from DBs, like he needs to put on a little bit more weight. But he's – I think Florida State got a good one in him. Mm-hmm. And they were using him – you know, Nate, you talked about it before we pre- – well, we were previewing the wide receivers before spring camp started. And even whenever Florida State landed Malik McLean, you were talking about him being a red zone threat. They were utilizing him out wide at red zone. So do you want to apply for – a coaching job somewhere or is it just no i, I mean wisdom well, uh, is it just what, your wisdom from your beard from that those yeah, gray it, hairs coming out yeah, of there it's on my itchy gray hairs is but, it um, really and that hair too that hair yeah, is man, getting it's real coming, wild up there it's coming in man i'm trying uh, to have it's a really coming in cut like you man <laughs> you know, but, jersey but, shore over here yeah man fist pumping but <laughs> now uh, i think that it's purposeful him playing as much as he did because you know he you know, he needs to – I was talking about on the Mark Rogers show that when he had me on a week and a half ago or so, you know, with, with him, kind of said the same thing. You know, you can put him, put him – play him inside the 20 in the red zone and he's going to go up and make a play for you. But what he needs to work on is that, you know, between the 20s and, and become a, a more consistent route runner. And I think that's purposeful playing him as much as they did because they're going to need him. They're going to need Burrell. They're going to need – Destin Hill. So, you know, when you still have the question marks at wide receiver coming in until week two now uh, uh, of of camp, two and a half, whatever you want to call that, and, and, and you still have some question marks there. But I think everyone realizes that your two best options aren't there yet. So you need you you need McLean to emerge. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a primary target, but someone that can come in and and stretch the field for you or make some tough catches or go up and get the ball for you in, in the red zone. And I think that's going to be his main thing. I, I disagree a little bit with Dustin on, on, on the size thing. I think he, he's pretty physically put together. Um, and that's his main advantage right now. He's got to learn how to run routes and get separation um, in, in college, but he's going to be a guy who can, both him and Burrell, I think, will be really, really good inside the red zone because they can make the, the tough catch. Yeah, and I mean, Burrell's not an elite, like an elite burner guy, but the way that he was able to get out of his cuts on some of those routes on Saturday, he's got he's got that football speed, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, nice. You know, yeah, you know, the technical part of his game is, is there, you know, and and. Not everyone's a, a, a four three four four guy. It's just not the way it works. Everyone's not blessed to, with that. But he knows how to use the size. And he knows how to run routes. And he knows how to get open. So you know, the, have, you know, we had Kenny Shaw on here a couple weeks ago. That's one thing he did so well. Yeah, he's not going to kill you with his physical attributes, but he knew how to get open. He knew how to, you know, he's a natural route runner. You know, he knew how to you know, switch up his route and get open for the quarterback. And that's the stuff that Burrell knows how to do. Um, so, you know, there's still question marks at wide receiver, you know, coming into where we're at now at, at this point in spring. But got to get got to use his practices to get some answers. You know, you, you need a guy like Jordan Young to flip that switch. You know, I just don't understand what, what what's going on there. Having some of the best highlight tape you can ever see it just hasn't come together for him. Um, you know, a guy like, you know, Portier, a guy like Williamson are guys who have a lot of promise and I think can, are going to contribute this year. You know, they got, they, they got to keep it, keep it move, moving forward. So. Yeah. Uh, Ken, how, Ken how, did, how did Helton look? He yeah, didn't nothing. do very much. Nothing. nothing. But he was out on the, the starting lineup, though. Yeah, I was going to say, out of the starters, which I believe were Helton and also Wilson, and if I'm correct, Ja'Kai Douglas was in there mm-hmm. as a starting wide receiver. Um, You know, Wilson, Logan mentioned that play by Wilson, but I would say Douglas caught caught the most passes out of that group. He was, he was consistently open. Nothing mm-hmm. 
nothing too big or anything. But I, I, like I don't. That, but I don't think we should be surprised as a fan base to see possibly um, Parchment Hill and Douglas as your starting three. Yeah, when we first arrived, it was easy to show. Dust, I told him. Josh Burrell looks like he's a junior. I mean, the size that he has on him is great. He's in shape. Um, like you said, he's not a big burner, uh, but he did put himself in some good positions where he was open and he was able to, sh- uh, you know, be physical and try to shut off very blocks. And, yeah, very strong hands. And you're able to see he's, he's got a very nice frame on him and he's just, you know, it shows. We saw videos of him squatting ridiculous amounts for a true freshman coming in. So uh, he's got, he's got some great size on him. Um, let's see, but I am, I am very excited to have Destin Hill and Parchman just to only amp up that competitive nature in that room, because, you know, it's nice to see you have a, a Malik McLean, McLean out there who is getting a lot of reps, a ton of reps. And it's good to see these guys striving. Cause they know if, you know, you, you got two other cats coming in that have some high priority with some great skill that are going to get a majority of these, of this PT. If you're going to try to get any of it, you might as well go now. So um, obviously Norvell and Dillingham have a lot of trust and, and belief in McLean and, and Burrell. I mean, they talked about it too at the opening of the, uh, you know, the opening press conference for the spring. They talked very highly of these two. So I, I, should I'm be a, a shocker. Shouldn't be a shocker. I'm a little bit higher on Ontario Wilson than some other people are. You know, I, I, I think he's just a good football player, but you know, this is make or break for Jordan Young, man. Like you're about to get passed. You know, yeah. you're about to you're about to get recruited over a guy who's got all the gifts, and th- this is this is your time to either you know do it or or you're gonna get passed up, man. You know. Uh huh. And Ontario had a fantastic. Like I said, that that uh, Jordan Travis to, and Terry Wilson on the sideline there was a, was by far the the best catch of the the spring or that scrimmage. That was a phenomenal catch, almost one handed, but. Beautiful, had two feet down. Uh, it was a beautiful catch. So, yeah. And Young had that great, great catch on the post route mm-hmm. where, I mean, it would have been a touchdown. It was probably the second, second longest pass play of the day outside of that um, route that McLean just got away from the whole defense on down the sideline. Now, looking into uh, this upcoming Saturday, Dustin and I plan on being there. What, what do you think? You know, what are we looking for heading into this second spring scrimmage? Are we looking for maybe Milton to be in better rhythm heading out there? Um, is there maybe a younger guy you're looking forward to? Are we going to see the defense dominate? Is the offense going to dominate? Is there going to be a running back that's better than Treshawn Ward, the walk-on? <laughs> yeah, you kind of said it. I want to see McKenzie get into a little bit more of a rhythm on Saturday. And, I mean, we'll see if that happens. You know, it's only been a week since the last scrimmage. But we'll just have to see. And um, other than that, really, I don't want to see one side dominate the other side. I think Nate kind of said it earlier. But I want to see both of these sides making plays because you don't want, you know, a one-side dominant team. You want your team to be balanced. And I, I think it's better in practice that way if the defense, you know, isn't just kicking the offense's ass or vice versa. You want both of them to be able to make plays because, I mean, that's how you get lied to. You know, last year we heard about how good the defense was and we saw what kind of offense they were facing in practice. So I, I want to see them compete against each other and, and go at it. And defense wins some, offense wins some. I think it, it's going to be a good day, Logan. Uh-oh, Nate's talking while his mic's muted. Oh, I, I want to see some separation. I want to see some guys start to earn a spot. Mm-hmm. You know? That's, that's what I want to see. You know, guys start to put it put it together and you know stake a claim for for the for a position. Yeah, adding to that, I want to see McLean keep doing what he was doing this past Saturday because I mean he's gonna he's gonna find his he's gonna find snaps if he keeps performing like that. Jumping into before or before we jump into the. FSU versus Michigan preview. Um, and we actually need to note on a few things here, though. I completely forgot. But Demory Tate, we saw that was in a boot on a scooter. We were trying to eye him from – he was on the other corner of the, uh, the stadium over there on the field. But 
that really wasn't a great thing to see a guy who we were projecting that had the potential of being a starting corner this season, eventually be on a scooter, fully wrapped, uh, fully wrapped and, leg there. And some of the things that, you know, we shared as a group, you know, between us mm-hmm. about him. So it's not disappointing. a disappointing. Yeah. Uh, it stinks. It's yeah. Mike Norville said in the press conference, um, the Maury Tate, Leonard Warner and Thomas Schrader will all miss extended time. Mm-hmm. And from what we've heard on Schrader, it could be season ending. So mm-hmm. we'll just see how it shakes out. Well, let's jump into a little bit of some pro day stuff here before some recruiting notes. Florida State held their pro day um, earlier this week. Get paid, Monday. Asante. Go get paid. Yeah, let's read off some things here for Asante Samuel Jr. Obviously, a pretty some pretty big since we don't have an NFL combine this year. The pro days are the big days, so we should probably go and see who was in attendance for the uh, pro day for Florida State Steelers GM Kevin Colbert and head coach Mike Tomlin. Representing yeah, I was going to say, Steelers. I think you know who was there. Yeah, oh yeah, I know who was there. Bills GM Brandon Bean was there. Packers GM Brian. Utikinus, that's just ridiculous last night. You didn't try to pronounce that before the show? Never in a million First time you're reading that was off. I would still screw it up. I've never read this one, though. Uh, (laughs) Defensive line coaches from the Steelers, Cowboys, and Bengals, and some defensive back coaches from the Patriots, Cardinals, and Dolphins. Sante Samuel Jr. weighed in at 180 pounds, had a wingspan of 72 inches, and one fourth. 40 yard dash, a four, four, five unofficial. That's big that for sh- him. Yeah, that should uh, seal up at least a late first round to, you know, first, uh, se- early second round. That was a nice day for him. We got to see a few videos, but there wasn't a lot of media there, but uh, really needed to go out there and show his, his speed uh, and whatever else that the scouts wanted them to get out there and work on. So, yeah, Sante Samuel Jr. What is he first? What do you say? Late first? So early second? I think right now for me he's early second. But yeah, I might be wrong. I, I mean, I mean, th- th- my my only thing was I wanted to see what he ran. I think the forty is kind of just an overrated thing. But you know, you have to have that speed at in the NFL. So you know, the the, the tape is there, and, and now the the measurements and the you know, him being an explosive athlete there. So I, th- I think that, you know, he's going to be at worst a, a mid second round guy now. I, I, I think that's definitely going to be his floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, 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 it just all depends on how things unfold. You know, I, I think that, you know, Sertain and, and JC Horn have probably separated themselves with their pro days um, with, with, you know, what, what they were able to do over the last couple of days. But he's definitely. I think number three. And once you start making runs on corners, people start drafting. So, yep. It was pretty funny, though. Uh, speaking of Steelers, uh, they had the pro day. And then the next day, the Steelers release corner Steven Nelson. Mm-hmm. And I just saw, you know, Florida State just released a picture of Mike Tomlin and Asante have a nice, firm handshake together. Well, my, my, Mike Tomlin, you know, He's always he always comes to Tallahassee. I don't know if he's got like he some kind of hook up here. I don't know. He's got some kind of hook up. I, I, I see it in my IMG a lot, man. I mean, he yeah. he, he likes the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. He but always comes to Tallahassee. I, I, I think that was a good time by Tamara and Terry too. I yeah, think no. that, you know, r- running in the low four fours with with the size and, and with the with the tape. I, I think that someone's going to take a, a chance on him. Yeah, 10-6 10, 6, 10, broad jump, too, which is pretty impressive. Arms 33 well, inches by 3 well, eighths. Yeah, which is massive. I don't yeah. care how long his arms are, Logan. Give me something important. I would care if I'm a wide receiver how long my arms oh, are. Yeah, absolutely. What, what about his – what do he, brought, what do he uh, vert? Like 35 inches, 34 inches? 32.5. I'm correct. Maybe expect a little bit better there, but, you know yeah. – the speeds there, the shuttle times were good. His yeah. bicep was decent. You know, he's, he's a long body and he can run. So, yeah. 
Uh, Hamsa was dealing with a hamstring injury. Oh, hamstring. It happened. Yeah. yeah. He had a hamstring injury during training before this. So uh, he did not run the 40 or do broad jump. Uh, but I said that. He did do position, girl, uh, position drills. Yeah, he did do a, a few position drills. He did bench. He did 17 reps. Uh, one of the impressive things here is, uh, I believe this is I'm trying to read like 85 stats at once. You said but, he did 17 reps? Yep, 17 reps of bench. Hmm. It's not awful uh, for how long his arms are. Same thing with. He's a lanky guy. I'll wait, I'll wait till he reads uh, Janarius Robinson's yeah. bench till I add my comparison. <laughs> I, I was going to go to this. I got, I, got a, I got a player that I'm going to compare to his bench, and y'all are going to be like, bro, like, I'm serious. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I was going to say someone that did good for himself. I know he, he's already an athletic freak, but he's been this way since high school. But Janarius Robinson came in at 263. Wingspan of 86 and one-fourth. We knew, we, I mean, this is the just freakish size. Uh, he, he DM me and said he did not run a slow ass four, seven, eight. He said he was uh, late. He said four, six at the worst. So, uh, he, he did not run a four, seven, eight, uh, Jim Nagy. He ran probably a four, 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 five, five, four, five, four, six flat somewhere around. If you think he ran a four, five, you're crazy. That's all I'll say. If he, if he thinks he ran a four, five, he's crazy. Four, four, six, sub. Uh, like I, wouldn't, four, I wouldn't even four seven that. running four seven at six five two. Six, oh, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's a great. That's a good time. It's planned. Dustin is a. I like it that Dustin's the number one coming after these people in their athleticism. Dustin, whenever we go down to You've Orlando, never seen me do the three cone drill. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Dustin's I got. Going I got after sweet. Him. I got sweet feet. All right, <laughs> step off. But anyways, going I mean, back what to, was Marvin Wilson's bench? How many did he get? I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to uh, Janarius's. So Janarius over here popped off with these long arms. 25 reps at 225 bench. 25 times for Dean right there. Marvin Wilson repped it 23 times. Came in at 303 pounds. Ran a 5-12-40. Let, let, let's hear that calm, Dustin. So this is why Florida State needs Josh Storms for the future. Okay, because over over at Purdue, you've got Rondell Moore, who's going to be a pretty solid NFL draft prospect. Five seven, five seven, one eighty. Yeah, he measured in at five seven, one eighty. He didn't participate in the bench press at the combine, but he posted a a, a video to his Twitter of him doing two twenty five. He did it twenty four times, more than Marvin Wilson, more than Hamza, right under Janarius Robinson, five foot seven, one hundred eighty pounds. I mean, yeah. that's why Florida State needs a real strength and conditioning yeah, coach. But also, his arms are like 21 inches long. I, you know, let me, at, let me look those things up. L- look it up. See how long his arms are. <laughs> how no. long are? Uh, I, I fully agree with you. I, I think I think Marvin was disappointing in, in, in his numbers, and I think that um, I was happy to see a lot of these teams question his reasoning for putting that crap out there at the start of the season with, with Norvell and all that kind of stuff. I was happy to see these coaches kind of confront him on that. Cause that was just not acceptable. So no, I think, no. Uh, he cost himself a lot of money this year. Yeah. I think it, it hurt him a lot. And biggest thing. Let me get, give me your prediction. Give me your prediction. Cause last year there was talk that he could be a first round guy. Fourth. And then <laughs> fourth. I think he's probably like late third. I think a late third is my prediction right now. I think it's a weak, weak defensive tackle class. I think it's mm-hmm. going to jump on it. Yeah, I think it's just, I don't know. But yeah, no, I do agree. I mean, definitely, most certainly hurt himself. He would be, uh, he would be at worst a, a second round if. So I guess here's another he question. He didn't for you guys. stay. Here's another question for you guys because J Rob is done really well for his stock since the senior bowl. And I mean, he mm-hmm. did pretty, pretty well at the, um, the pro day. Yeah. So, is there any chance a team take, takes a leap on him and you know those physical tools and potential that he has drafting before Marvin Wilson? No chance. I, I don't see J Rob being better than like a fifth. 
No, so right I now, I don't Mark, think it's like something that is oh, like oh, just oh. right off the bat. Like, did no. you find his arm length? Hold on. <laughs> okay, so I couldn't find it. I think if a if a DN's coach, he ran a four two nine. Right. Rondell ran Rondell ran a four two nine. Yeah. So Ooh. hold on. Marvin Wilson did. <laughs> No, um, <laughs> <laughs> this a four two nine. Uh, uh, nah, Rondell Moore, Demarcus Christmas, oh. Robert Cooper, Justin Lewis. You would fall on your face. And, if your and, legs and were jumped, moving that fast. And he jumped forty two five. So that guy's an explosive guy, but I think he lost some money coming in at five seven, not the five nine that was listed. Oh yeah, definitely. That's going to be a problem. That's a small but, dude. I mean, they're going to comp him to Tyreek Hill, but. You know, Tyreek Hill's speed is just different. Who's the dude on the Bears? Uh, Co- Cohen. Cohen. Yeah, people were, people were comparing Cohen. him to him, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, Mike Tomlin, my brother, you, you can make up for everything if – well, not really. I mean, we were supposed to, like, win a Super Bowl. But um, uh, you could save everything, and uh, I will – give you a hall pass if we bring on Asante. But if you think about, you know, Steelers also looking for uh, a Fox too. So could it be later on down the road, uh, a J Rob or even a Kane Doe? I don't know. I mean, you, you, you they've, uh, the Steelers brought their defensive line coach too. So, well, I, I think that, you know, he made some money at the senior role. I think, you know, he's, he, he NFL is always, I agree with Austin. It's super enamored with, you know, physical freaks. And there's always a coach that thinks that they can be the guy to turn it around and, and put it all together for him. So some team's going to reach for him. Um, but we've seen it for four years now that three years, whatever, that he's just not put it all together in the field. Has flashed abilities to be a dominant guy, but just still left you with like, what are you doing, man? Like, Why'd you just do that? So I, I think I, I think that when teams cut on the tape, they're gonna just wonder, like, you know, what, what what's going on here? You know, he's a physical freak, but at the same time, just you know, he's not creating havoc. Is Terry second round latest? No. Third. Um. <laughs> 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 It's tough for him. I think it's an interesting uh, uh, spot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think his I, athleticism, I think that, he's a yeah. he's an he's a freak. He's a freakish athlete. I mean, his football speed's better than I think his reg, you know, his yeah. off the field yeah, speed. I, I, his football speed's ridiculous. There's some I, I, guys I, that can run fast without pads, but he runs fast with pads. You know what I'm saying? I, I think he's definitely a uh and he got significantly faster before. Yeah, he he's a, he, he's an interesting case study because he produced, he has all the physical traits that these guys look for in the NFL. Um, I, despite th- this past year, I, I, I'm still a fan of his. I think that he's going to do really well in the NFL. So even if he goes second, third round, I think that he's going to be steel. You know, it's also just a really good draft for wide receivers this year, you know, for the next three to four years, it's last year, this year, next year, it, it's, a, it's a deep draft. So even if it is third round, it's not necessarily a bad thing in terms of, um, how deep the class is this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you going to draft tomorrow and Terry over Devonte Smith or Jamar chase? No, Jalen Waddle. No. Um, Rondell Moore. I, th- I think maybe we have a conversation there because I think, you know, more, more size is now definitely a, a question mark, mm-hmm. but he's a really damn good football player. Now, it, it's just going to be interesting to see how, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how it unfolds. Cause you know, he's got everything there and has produced, but something just doesn't seem right. I think why I think because it's such a deep wide receiver draft, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a day three pick. Yep. And I mean, most big boards, like I was Googling while you were talking, like most big boards have him between like 10 and 15 in the wide receivers, which, you know, that's all pie in the sky, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a day three pick just because of, you know, left the season early. Been dealing with injuries, as as you said, something's not right. But he's clearly talented. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Not nothing on his arm size. Just the one thing is that on Moore going back there, I can't find it, but they said uh, his catch radius is not big, so he's gonna have to be someone that you man- manufacture touches. Hmm. Well, Dustin, there's some recruiting notes in here. Obviously, like we talked about, Force State plans on holding a second scrimmage. And it seems like there's a good amount of visits, including Florida State's 2022 quarterback commit right now, Nico Marchio, traveling from his home state. Yeah, you know, just like uh, this past weekend, there's going to be some recruits in Tallahassee to uh, watch the open scrimmage, you know, tour campus, also check out the city, just kind of depending on how long that they're here. But the guys that I have personally confirmed that will be there – on Saturday, uh, this Saturday. Um, for 2022, you got offensive tackle, Daltry Richardson, linebacker Devin Smith, and offensive guard Kanaya Charlton. And then 2023, uh, wide receiver Raymond Cottrell, and 2023 running back uh, FSU commitment, Cedric Baxter. And this will actually be the second weekend in a row that Cottrell has been in attendance at the scrimmage and, and been in Tallahassee. So he's got to like what he's seeing. And then those 2022 guys, all three of them are pretty, pretty high targets for FSU that they're, they're trying to get in the class. I'd watch Charlton. That's he's not, on commit watch. He's been talking about a spring commitment. So is Richardson. So We'll see. I mean, see. it it could happen on Saturday. I'll try and get the scoop. <laughs> yeah, things have been quiet, you know. You know, so I mean, too quiet. We'll, we'll see. You know, there's going to be guys that you know pop in that you, you don't know about. So, right. Yeah, like Logan said, uh, 2022 quarterback and commit Nico Markyall is going to be in Tallahassee. I think he announced that on on Instagram, and then. You know, it's only Wednesday night, so there's definitely going to be some other guys that decide to um, attend on Saturday. I reached out to um, Aaron Hester, and he said that he's considering coming up this weekend, and there were there were a couple other guys that are considering making the trip. So we'll just have to see how it shakes out. Mm-hmm. Could you say it's some names that maybe who are leaning maybe towards committing in the spring who might be on commitment watch? Um. Two guys that are on the list that, that me and Nate just mentioned. Offensive tackle, Daughtry Richardson, who actually played at Godby for um, at least a season. I don't know. Nate, maybe you know. One and then year. also – okay. Then also offensive guard, uh, Kaniah, Char- Kaniah Charlton, who is uh, from Brunswick up in Georgia. So those are two guys that Florida State has been on for a while. Sweet deal. Well, let's jump into some Chick Fil A trivia before. Wait, 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 wait. wait. All right, my bad. Let me get Oops, my other. Recruit- Let me get my other recruiting nugget. Oh yeah. So there was a rumor floating around. I don't know if it's been the last couple of weeks, but it was something that I kind of found this weekend, talking about um, 2022 running back Demari Alston out of Georgia um, reclassifying to the 2020-21 class and then signing with Auburn. So that he could play this year. <clears throat> so, yeah, I read up on that, checked it out. I guess he needed one class or something like that to be able to graduate early and, and make that move. But I talked to him early this earlier this week, and he said that he's going to remain in the 2022 class. He's not going to reclassify, which is definitely good news uh, on Florida State side of things. And he he's also planning to visit the spring game. And I mean, he's right up there at the top of that running back board along with another guy who was recently in Tallahassee and, and Jalen Glover, who we did an up, update with earlier this week. Sweet deal. Some good little nuggets there. A little, little baby nugget. Uh, all right, let's jump into some Chick-fil-A trivia before we preview this big game with Florida State and Michigan on Sunday. Big game? There's a big game coming up? There's a big one. I think Austin might know about it. I don't know. Slightly yeah. huge. Yeah, slightly might be a big one. Is it, that's what is, you, is that's it revenge what you, time? That's what you say all the time in the tender DMs, isn't it? Slightly. Here we go. Oh, God, dude. That was bad. All right. 
Mm-hmm. There we go. Let's jump. I love how we're jumping right into a Chick Fil A <laughs> right before this. Great segue. Uh, yeah, great segue. Let's talk about some food and Chick Fil A. Our good friends from over there on West Tennessee Street. Go say what's up to them if you're going to the spring scrimmages. Me and Dustin did it before FSU's basketball game. We hit the drive through over there on West Tennessee Street. They're fast. The food is always good. The sauce is amazing. I don't need to say anything more. Chick Fil A is. I went after the scrimmage too. I did too. I saw you in the drive thru That's what I was just saying. It was fire. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. <laughs> all right. This is a good one. All right. So for the first 19 years of operation, Chick-fil-A restaurants could only be found where? Georgia. Georgia. Found in Atlanta, oh, bro. Oh, wait, no. Mm. How about... Uh, it's a... Food courts. It, uh, you're, no, you're correct. I'm, I mean, you're not going to know the name of it, maybe, but it's called the Food Court of Greenbrier Mall. Nate's on top of these. Wow. He also has some time it's my, on us. It, it's, it's, it's your my, wisdom? It, it, it's, not, it, it's my... It's my industry, dude. You know. Uh, true. That <laughs> is true. He, you have an advantage of us here. Uh, let's read it up. Uh, the first it just ever- makes sense to be like, you know, like a Sabaro starts in a mall. You know. True. The first ever Chick Fil A restaurant opened in 1967 in the food court of the Greenbrier Mall. For nearly two decades, the business model was focused solely on opening restaurants and mall food courts only. Try to imagine a Chick Fil A without drive-throughs today. Couldn't imagine it, but it sounds about right. Nate knows his history and food, so you might keep your job, Nate. My job? Yeah, your job. Potentially, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's jump into some Florida State basketball. Uh, obviously, big time showdown, Florida State. Number four seed versus number one seed, Michigan. I mean, we still need to go back and look at um, Florida State's win against Colorado. But uh, obviously, a good week for the Knowles in basketball, trying to turn some things around and get some energy heading into a big game on Sunday. It was a solid weekend. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the Greensboro game was sloppy, um, a lot sloppier than I was expecting. But, you know, a, a win in March is still a win in March. You were able to contain Isaiah Miller for the most part. If it wasn't for Keyshawn Langley, it's a 20-point win. And we did it without hitting a three, which couldn't tell you the last time that happened. I think they said it was 2018 was the last time we won yeah. a game without hitting a three. Um, then the Colorado game, ugly first half, and then just an absolute beatdown second half. You know, Colorado got within one point um, after two back-to-back baskets from Evan Batty. Then Florida State just completely flipped the momentum. You got that lob to play, that lob play to Sadar Calhoun. He had that one stretch in about 25 game seconds of foul on Colorado, technical foul on Colorado, backcourt violation, Anthony Plight in the three pointer. It was a 10 point swing in a span of 25 seconds. And, you know, in March, that's such a big swing, especially in the second half. Florida State was so good in that second half against Colorado. If that team shows up on Sunday, I mean, watch out. That, that's a dangerous team. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, man, Anthony Plight was just just simply terrific. I mean, it was it was the perfect time for him to kind of rise up to the occasion and have the best game ever of his college career. You know, he came out, he hit those two early threes, and I kind of think that helped the rest of the team become a little bit more confident after not making a shot from behind the arc, like you mentioned in that first game. And they started letting him fire. You know, we were actually seeing some three-point attempts. I forget exactly – how many it was? I think we finished four of eleven. Uh, six out of six out of seventeen. Six of so you put up nearly double the amount of double the amount of temps from deep in that first game, and I thought that really stretched out the four for Florida State. And then also just Scotty Barnes. You know, he wasn't. He still isn't at that aggressive level that you really want yet. But he was making some dimes against Colorado. I mean, no look passes. Yeah, once, once Colorado went about two three, it was over. He just picked them apart. He had I mean, so, he had two really good passes back to back. He had one to pull light on the baseline, yeah, and then another one right to White Wilkes, who got the easy floater like five yeah. feet away. I mean, just two insane passes. It was beautiful. It, they're going to need him to be aggressive on Sunday. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. 
you know, he, he needs to have more than two shot attempts, um, which he's had both of these two games so far. But really the story of the game for Colorado was defense. I mean, they just completely smothered Colorado um, from the jump. I, I posted a screenshot of Twitter of the Colorado's first inbounds pass, and McKinley Wright's got two people on him when the ball is being inbounded 20 feet away. F- from that moment on, M- McKinley Wright hardly touched the ball. You know, yeah, he took 12 shots, but there were some really bad shots. He had five turnovers, only one assist compared to, well, I think he had 13 against Georgetown. I mean, when you can, when you contain a player like that, and they didn't really have a secondary creator. They, they don't have somebody that can create looks for other people like McKinley Wright can. You, you limit him and you see the results. They shot 35% from the floor, 24% from three, and only got to the free throw line 11 times. Defense was the, the big reason why Florida State won both games this weekend, not just Colorado. Yeah, I mean, like you said, even as ugly as it was on the offensive side for Florida State in that first half, that was the best performance on defense in, in 20 minutes that we've seen all season. I mean, you nailed it on the head. They locked them down. The rotations were perfect. The switches were perfect. They contested every shot. The rebounding has, has still got to improve, definitely. I feel like they still give up too many offensive rebounds at times. But, I mean, they only gave up, eight. I mean, 18 real points in that half. You know, the last, the last one was a runaway layup as the clock expired that they kind of gave up, kind of a BS layup. But 18 points in 20 minutes, even 28 points in 20 minutes. I mean, they were just locked in. Like you said, if they bring that same level of intensity to this game on Sunday and they continue to blossom from that second half that they had against Colorado offensively, guys like Malik Osborne, Anthony Polite continue to contribute, also stays out of foul trouble and plays more than however however few minutes he played uh, the other time. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get to predictions yet, but I'm feeling really good about Florida State weekend yeah a, a couple key stats from the colorado game the i think i think the biggest one is fast break points florida state led those 20 to 2 points in the paint 28 to 16 for florida state and then even though colorado had what was it uh 16 offensive rebounds they only had 10 second chance points i mean florida state was swarming the court there's a lot a few offensive rebounds where it was just long rebounds florida state couldn't really do anything about them mm-hmm. and yeah you want to see those cleaned up either way because against Michigan, you got a guy like Hunter Dickinson who can just dominate down low, especially on the offensive glass. You're going to have to clean those up. You're going to have to really box out hard. Um, but it, it was so much fun watching that second half after you know, everyone's like, oh, Colorado's going to win. They just blew out Georgetown. They just put up 96 points. They're going to kill Florida State. It was a completely different Colorado team. G- Georgetown's ball screen defense was so bad for what Colorado likes to do. And Florida State just had none of it. Their switching scheme gave Colorado fits all game. But you play that defense, you, you, you're going on a tournament run. So, yeah, I, I put it, it on Twitter. It's that easy, man. Like, I put it on Twitter, Florida State's defense has been so good through two games. They've gone from 43rd in defensive efficiency to 29th in two games. That's huge. incredible. Mm-hmm. That's a, such a big jump because now you're going from the great tier to the elite tier, and that's hard to do in two games. Nate, uh, I, 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 I think if that continues, you know, FSU's going to lead eight. Nate, real quick, someone from the YouTube here uh, says, Nate enjoys going to food courts instead of shopping at the mall. Is that true or false? It, it, it depends what's in the food court. <laughs> you know? Tomorrow? Chick- Chick-fil-A. I mean, Chick-fil-A is always an option. You know? <laughs> Chick-fil-A is in every food court. But, you know. Not in mine. But you wow. know, yeah, it sucks. It, it, it just depends what what's there, you know. I mean, I I have uh, a wife and kids, so it, it's sometimes nice to go just sit down and not shop. And if I can get a Chick Fil A ice cream or you know Philly <laughs> cheesesteak, so be it. Well, that ice cream might get in that beard, so watch out. All right. Anyways, back to uh, BZ's uh, rundown here. I, th- I think at this point we got we got to cover Michigan, right? Is it time? I need to tweet it. I got to let the. Or should, should we talk about the two quick hitters first? Give me the quick hitters. Give me the quick hitters. Uh, the best f- comes to last. Yeah, Fiondo Cabangeli got traded to the Kings. Um, for I think it was like a second round pick in cash. They're just opening up a roster spot to try and get a point guard. 
hopefully he gets a chance to play in Sacramento. I think he's still really talented, and Sacramento needs big. So hopefully he gets some minutes there. And then just are, are you be. surprised he hasn't gotten that much run in the NBA? A little bit, because I think he's got such a unique skill set at 6'11", can defend multiple positions, hit a three. I just think he's still a little bit too out of pocket, I guess. Like he plays a little bit too crazy. I think he's phenomenal. I think the right team. I mean, that's out the best way to describe plays him. Out of that's the best way to describe him. Sometimes he just goes a little too crazy. I, I love him. But sometimes he just plays a little too crazy, a little bit out of the system. Um, that's I what think, Calhoun was doing a, a little bit, I thought. Yeah. It, it, the, if the right team gets a hold of Fiondo, I think he's going to be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It, he's just got to go to the right team. I mean, you mm-hmm. see what Terrence Mann's doing in the, with the Clippers. So, yeah, 21 points the other night in a comeback win. Yeah, he's been, 10, keeping, right? he's been keeping yeah. them in games. He was phenomenal. He's been playing six man roles for them now. Hey, um, form, uh, I hear the Spear alum, I must yeah. add. And, he, uh, just, he, gave just a nice, he gave a nice little speech, too, about you know being with Fee for the past four or five years and yeah. you know, now parting ways. He had a nice little. It's got to be tough. I mean, yeah, you, you've been with a guy for five years. I mean, those two are basically brothers at this point. Yeah, they really had to break him up. Like, come on. I think they lived in the same apartment complex in L.A. too. Who do I need to fight? Is it is it Doc Rivers that's there? No, Doc's a oh, dude. <laughs> He's a little Wait, behind. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to 2021. <laughs> Hold on, give me a second. I think, it's, I think Jerry West is running. Wait, oh, Donald Trump's not president anymore either. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, it's Lou, isn't it? I mean, yeah, he's the coach, but Jerry West is running the show. Well, yeah, I, well, I wasn't that stupid naming it. That didn't. I was just saying the coach here, but uh, Billy Taggart's yeah, no longer at you. FSU. He's not. You got to be shit, bro. He just got let. He got let go. Holy crap! Probably too much dancing, right? Uh, but yeah, screw. Who is it, West? I guess. Yeah, I'll come after him. I'll take care yeah. of him. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure you will. And then, and then should we all pick an upset from the bracket so far? Oh, yeah, there's a yeah, there's a lot of good upsets this weekend. You need to pick one. All right, hold if up. It, if, I mean, I know where Logan's going. We're, 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 we're picking our Whoa. favorite upset. Favorite upset. Oh, I'll we're picking first. our favorite I'll one so far. Oh, I thought I was about to predict this upcoming weekend. No, no, no. Okay, no. Fa- okay. Favorite upset so far from the first weekend. My favorite upset. I mean, and there's so many. I mean, it's so hard to choose mm-hmm. from. But I would say my favorite one was Ohio beating Virginia. That was a fun game. Yeah. Last podcast, I was talking about Jason Preston. I mean, he did pretty good. And then they had that uh, Vanderboss. Vanderboss, yeah. Yeah. Dude went crazy. Yeah, he was – at one point, I swear, he scored 10 or 12 straight. You got his dad in the stands, like, freaking out, like (laughs) a madman. I mean, that game was just awesome. Like, there was so much emotion. And I don't know. I also like seeing Virginia lose. (laughs) I, I, I didn't get to I see that one. Over Roberts, man, mainly because of all the smack they've been talking on Twitter. It's been pretty, pretty interesting. It's been, it's been pretty, pretty funny. funny. It's yeah, fun. Pretty but uh, but now for that uh, that whole bracket is tore up. But um, so, yeah, yeah my mind's tore up. But uh, yeah, I mean, Oral Roberts beating Ohio State, and then Florida. You know, it's always great to see them lose. But uh, I mean, them and Loyola got to be the two, the two big. You know, them beating Illinois, knocking out the one seed. Mm-hmm. It's hard to even consider Loyola an upset because they're a top 10 Kempom team. They're the best defense in the country. Like, that team's for real. They were yeah. underseeded two or three seed lines. They should have been at least a six. Yeah, I, I mean, they might win that that bracket. That br- You want to talk about messed up brackets. Yeah, yeah look yeah. at it. It's Oregon State and Loyola. Yeah, Loyola, Oregon I'm, State, I'm at that Houston, one right now. and Syracuse. Yeah. Just what is going on down there? Where, yeah. where our bracket's pretty much chalk outside of UCLA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I I've loved them all. I mean, I don't really. I don't know if I really have a favorite. Of course, it's great to see Mike White. Uh, hopefully, he gets extended too. Um, I'm working on sending some money on getting his extension going, but uh, it's good to see them just do the regular thing. And I have so many Florida fans at work, and I get text messages all the time. It's good to see them out of there and. Um, yeah, Oral Roberts, probably loyal. I watched that whole game. It's just fun watching them. And you got Sister Jean up there chilling. I mean, is she running off of like robotics shit or something? I don't even know. It doesn't it's, make any sense, man. I think like, they're like, they have like strings on her arms and she's doing Who, who do you think is the two best teams right now left? Gonzaga and Baylor. Pretty easy. I think, dude, I think Loyola might be this. I think Loyola is going to beat Baylor in the final four. 
We'll see. Call me nuts. Wow. I think I think UCLA is going to beat Alabama. Oh, I hope so. I really hope so. I don't see Alabama. You know, someone put on Twitter today that Alabama is the only remaining team that can beat Gonzaga. I, I don't see it. But, I mean, they're good. They're they're but, really yeah. good. But I mean, we saw it in the first round. I mean, they're beatable. They almost UCLA lost. Is just, they're just hot right now. Yeah, Crazy. they're playing really well. I mean, Mick Cronin's a phenomenal coach. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, I, haven't pick, I haven't picked my upset yet. Abilene Christian over Texas was the was craziest game. One. I didn't get to see that one. Dang. Abilene Christian was outmatched at every single position. I think they shot like 28% from the floor <laughs> and beat Texas, who was it was a really good team. They've got multiple <laughs> NBA picks, and they, they won the game. I think they forced Texas into 22 turnovers. Mm-hmm. I loved it. It was so much fun. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, no matter which one you choose, this was just it was this was an epic weekend of March Madness. I think they said if you like add up all the seeds that into the Sweet Sixteen, it's the highest ever. Mm-hmm. Almost think, the six seed average. Yeah, I think it was a five point eight average. Yeah, which and then just add up all the seeds completely. I think it was like eighty six or something. I mean, it's an insanely high number. It was a fun first weekend. Really fun I, first weekend. I, I still have all my Final Four teams alive. Oh, I do not. I have two left. <laughs> really? Yeah. I've got one left. And, and my national championship picks out. So uh, we're, we're down for the count. Who was it again? I had Illinois as my yeah. champion. And then I had Ohio State in the Final Four, which rip. Oh. I, I, I need one of them to lose to, to – I need Michigan to go down. I mean, great segue. So, Phenomenal is segue. It? Yeah. Is this, is this it? All right. So Florida State's going to be facing number one seed – Michigan on Sunday at 5 p.m. What's the uh, TV station for that? TBS. Yeah, TBS. CBS. TBS. TBS. Not, T, that been a- not T, oh, C. C. Yeah. Prime well, time, excuse baby. Us. Prime time. Excuse Main us. Channel. I'm making sure you get it right, bro. At least if you're going to say C, say C and Charlie, sir. Please get it right. All right, Charlie BS. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anyways, Florida State's face on Sunday. The Michigan Wolverines is at revenge time. Is this what it's all about? It Looks be. like Florida State had energy the other day whenever they were placing, uh, when they were playing Colorado. That's something I have been high on. That was a really fun game to watch. Florida State was throwing alley oops. They were in their bag. I like Malik Osborne's energy. I like polite having the energy of not. He wasn't going to let this team lose. Um, just first thoughts on this matchup. Matchup, Austin. Do you? Is Florida State out of like, like talent wise? Or are they where are they, are they similar? Pretty similar, you know. I think Michigan's got five or six top one hundred guys. Um, really talented team. They're not as deep as Florida State, especially with Isaiah Levers expected to be out. Um, but I think Florida State matches up super super well with Michigan. Uh, I t- I tweeted last night and put it in the Discord. You know, Michigan's the fifth worst team in forced turnovers per game. They're eighth worst in first in forced turnover rate. They don't get they don't get a ton of re- offensive rebounds. They don't get to the free throw line a ton. They don't change defenses that much. They struggle against really athletic teams like Florida State. Um, we saw in their game against Illinois where Illinois just handed it to them. And Illinois is a really athletic team. Florida State's got a chance. I, I mean, we said it we've said it multiple times that if Florida State gets out the first weekend. They should really like how it sets up for the final weekend. Um, Michigan kind of struggled with LSU. We were able to pull away at the end once Franz Wagner started warming up. But Florida State really likes their chances here. There's a couple interesting storylines outside of just Isaiah Livers being out. You know, Coach Hamilton actually coached Jawan Howard for a season uh, with the Washington Wizards. And now they're coaching against each other 20 years later. Um, it's going to be a really fun game. Really, really fun game. Mm-hmm. Anybody, do any, anybody do anything special for it? Uh, so on, what was it? That was Saturday, if I'm correct. No, no, no. That was Thursday. I'm losing my mind. I've had a busy week. <laughs> God, I'm obviously losing my mind. I've had an uh, extremely busy week. I mean, it's on Sunday is my dad's birthday. So if Florida State loses on Sunday... You guys should blame my dad because I told him that when we watched the ACC championship together and Florida State lost, I wouldn't watch another game with him this season. And then today, he guilted me into watching the Sweet 16 game with him for his birthday. If we're so, losing at half, you have to leave. I will. I'll, I'll get the hell out of there. 
<laughs> I, I cannot lose to Michigan again because that game in 2018 still scars me. Okay, so like, yeah, now that uh, I'm just saying, you know, blame me. Um, no, that that was on Monday. So I had all my friends coming. So I'm, in, I'm, they're all coming back. Like every one of them doesn't matter if they're going to a funeral or their families in a house fire. They're all coming back to have the same group of people. So then. If one of them doesn't show up and we lose, I'll be exiting them from my friendship. I mean, it doesn't really mean much, uh, but I will be exiting them. And we need everybody back. Superstition. Nate, you can shake your head all you want. You wish you could watch a sporting event with us, but you're, you're in a household full of, of girls. No comment. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it G-rated. <laughs> G-rated? Yeah. Oh man. But yeah, I was going to ask you, Austin, you know, looking at health wise, how does Florida state look right now? You know, does this rest really helping them? I mean, for sure. I mean, we've seen Scotty Barnes be hobbled these last few weeks, you know, his ankle's still giving him issues. He's probably playing at like 65, 70%. You know, MJ hasn't been fully healthy since what late January, early February, he gets an extra week. Um, I guess that's the one benefit of the NCAA pushing it back another day instead of having the sweet 16 the same days as last week it's now saturday sunday and then elite eights monday tuesday um gives these guys a little bit of extra rest gives them an extra prep day uh they actually got to get outside the hotel yesterday they went to the indianapolis zoo which i know fantastic um mm-hmm. but yeah, that's fun a, yeah an extra day of rest never hurts anybody it's an extra day of getting used to indianapolis getting used to the gyms getting used to the arenas it, it, I mean, it can't hurt, certainly. The, the big thing is whether it's enough time for Isaiah Livers to come back for Michigan, which the way Jawan Howard sounded last on Monday night after the game, he still said he's out indefinitely. I don't think we'll see him this weekend. Well, What's Michigan do that can give Florida State fits? They've got – it's a very professional system because yeah. Jawan Howard was an NBA yeah. assistant for a while. They, so they've got these really – Early shot clock, quick hitters that can that give a lot of teams fit. They yeah, some- I, I thought LSU was going to run them out of the gym. You know, in that first half, you know, LSU kept getting up, getting up by like six or seven, get up by eight, and I thought they were going to pull away. The, Michigan just has so many give and goes. They've got these mm-hmm. zipper cuts for Wagner to get him going. They've got just so many little stuff to get guys going that it gives so many teams issues. I don't think it'll be that much of an issue for Florida State just because. You know, they switch everything. It, it doesn't matter what the action is. They're just going to switch it. Um, and with Michigan, you can't outscore them. It's, it's a team that you have to, you know, get down and dirty with, slow them down, really beat them up. If you let them run and gun, you know, crash the glass, get to the free throw line, then, yeah, you're going to have issues. And if you can get down and transition against them before their defense is set, even better. Um, but they're really bad in pick and roll, especially defensively. I think they're like – 18th percentile in pick and roll defense. And pretty much Scotty Barnes needs to drive the lane. He's every got day. he's got to get downhill. Yeah, got to go. It's gonna be one of those scenes where you got to get Dickinson away from the basket because Dickinson's so good. You get you got to get him in space and use it against him. Um, Dickinson's a really good athlete for his size, but he gets caught in space. He gets caught in space too often. I, I think you're gonna see a heavy dose of pick and roll on Sunday night. Whether it's Scotty Barnes, whether it's Evans, whether it's Raquan Gray, uh, mm-hmm. I, I think you see a lot of it, at least from the top of the key. J- just get Dickinson away from the basket, or maybe get him in foul trouble. Just drive right his body to try and create some fouls, get him off the floor because he's their best offensive threat. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I thought that you know, the refs caught a weird game this past weekend. You know, they were letting it go uh, in the paint, but calling I thought were some ticky tack stuff. Yeah. You know, everywhere else. You know, they're just letting them go. So, I mean, then he balls it a Bosch has got a, he's got Bosch know? has to play 25 minutes this game. Yeah. Uh, I I think ngam has got great potential, but he's he's going to get toasted by it. Yeah. Dickinson. Dickinson's the guy we're really familiar with. We recruited him hard. Mm-hmm. Really wanted him to come to Tallahassee. I think we made us top 4. He chose Michigan over us, Duke, and Notre Dame off the top of my head. Very talented player. We've also got Sean D. Brown, who we saw two times a year in the ACC for the last three years at Wake Forest. He had a very good game against LSU. I think he had 21 points off the bench. 
So there's some familiarity. And then obviously, Jawan Howard and Leonard Hamilton know each other very well. I'm sure they know each other's systems very well. There's been a lot of conversations back and forth between the two. It's going to be a really, really interesting game. I think if Florida State keeps it slow, but stays aggressive, I know it's, you know, it's hard to have one with the other. But if they can have it slow while still being aggressive, I think they have a very good chance. Well, what are some key factors for Florida State that FSU can win this game? What are your maybe top three key factors for this for the Knowles? Read, read the preview. <laughs> I haven't even written it yet. Yeah, I haven't even <laughs> yeah. written it yet. Walsh has got to stay on the floor. Barnes has to be aggressive. And I think you got to bully Michigan's guards. You know, Eli Brooks and Mike Davis are 5'11 and 6'1. That's a mismatch against Florida State's guards who are, you know, 6'5, 6'6, 6'9. You, you got to bully those guys. You got to make them feel really uncomfortable. It's not like with Colorado where you have one guy that can really dictate the whole offense. You know, he's got to have the ball for possession. It's not like that for Michigan. You know, Michigan plays through Hunter Dickinson a lot. It's hard to say get someone in foul trouble is a key, but if you can get Dickinson with two early fouls, it really changes the entire way the offensive offense flows because their backup, Austin Davis, is not good. You know, he's he's just a classic senior white guy. Big, but he's like he's smart, but he's not good. If you make him play 15, 20 minutes against Florida State, Michigan's gonna have a lot of issues. Is he gritty? Does he does he hustle? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even say he's that. He's just old. Is he's he just old in, of the game? He's first in, last out type of guy. Yeah, he's yeah. just old and experienced. That's all it is. That's the only reason he plays. If he plays 15, 20 minutes because Dickinson's in foul trouble, Florida State's going to win. Yeah, and I mean, the good thing is Florida State has so many different bodies that they can throw at Dickerson. Obviously, it's going to start off with Balsa. Then you can go to uh, Malik Osborne, to Nor Ingham, maybe even play some Raekwon Gray on him if you have to. So, I mean, there's just – you can give him multiple looks, and hopefully, you know, he makes mistakes. And like you said, Austin, you get him into early foul trouble, attack at the basket – Make him work all night. I mean, he had a he had a double double against LSU, and I mean he's been one of the best freshmen this season. And Florida State's gonna have to lock him down. He's the leading scorer. I mean, the entire yeah. offense runs through him because they just give him the ball at the high post, and he can pass out of it. He can drive. He's got such quick feet for a freshman center. I think Balsa is gonna be ready for the challenge for this one because you know he's got to be upset with how that last game went, fouling out and just 11 minutes and not really being able to make the impact that he wants to. So I feel like he's going to come out really motivated on Sunday night, playing a lot smarter. Florida state has plays and have sets that are purposely meant to get an opposing teams big in foul trouble. How the first five or six minutes goes, where if we run it and, you know, Dickens either blocks it or the rest just let it go. That could have a huge play in the way that the entire game goes. But if, if they run these sets, he picks up a couple fouls. Florida State's just going to keep doing it all game. You just keep getting downhill, run lobs, get them in space. And even when you run those pick and lob or pick and rolls, you know, if you're doing it on these guards that are so small, you can get those guys on your hips and it's basically just like playing two on one at that point. This score prediction time. I know, Austin, it will be in your preview, but I feel like it's score prediction time. Gentlemen, hint, hint. If you want Florida State to win, pick a Michigan score under 67. Under 67. Is that a stat there? Give us a stat. Give us the reasoning. They're two and four. So they've only lost four games all season, and all four have come mm. when they score 67 points or less. That's a pretty good fact right there. So they need to score under 67, which the last two games Florida State's kept Colorado 53 and UNCG to 54. Mmm, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go. What are you feeling, Nate? What do you got? What, what's going on? We need some reasoning behind it too. <laughs> um, because I said so. No, no, no. I think that Florida State defense is playing really well. Um, I, I, that's just a, a very easy, basic statement. But I think that you know what made them kind of a, a trendy pick when they were 15 and three, whatever the, the record was, was that they, you know, they were scoring the ball better than probably they, they have under, under Hamilton. So, you know, if that defense is coming around um, and, and Florida State can score, I, I think they're a tough out for anyone. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that, I mean, I, I watched Michigan and LSU because I, I did expect Florida State to, to beat Colorado. So, 
even though I, I, I picked LSU to win because I thought they would be um, the athletic ability. Kind okay, of what Austin said earlier is why I picked LSU to win. Um, and that's why I would pick Florida State to win this game because I think that the defense is, is, is hot right now. I think that um, they shot a lot better. And they're a team that if they hit a couple of shots earlier, they're going to uh, they're, they're gonna create some, some havoc. And I think that Florida State is just going to – I think it's going to be a grinder of a game. And I'm going like – I said 73-70 earlier – on, on my Twitter, um, I, I don't like that stat that Austin just said, but I'm sticking with it because it's what I said. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, Florida State grinds it out. I think it's a tight game. I just think that Florida State's depth at the end of the day, I think, you know, getting Barnes a little more focused on, on going downhill, getting to the rim, I think that is, is going to be the difference. So, I just think Florida State it has – you know, it's a mismatch. You know, it's a style that, that is going to give Michigan fits. So, yeah, I completely uh, agree. That's I mean, my reasoning. That's thank my you reasoning. for giving me that. I was about to thank you. I was going to give you a full thanks, but thank you, Nate Greer, for your full rundown there. You're, your you're, you're welcome, Logan. You know, when you look when you look back at that second half that Florida State just had against Colorado, I mean, there there's not many teams remaining in the tournament that's going to be able to beat a team that plays that kind of half for, you know, the full game that are just for 20 minutes. But I think Florida State's going to come out on, on Sunday in, the, in their rhythm and, you know, punch Michigan in the mouth, get out to an early lead and make Michigan have to crawl back. I think it's going to end up being a close one as well, you know, just because Florida State, for some reason, I don't know, I don't know what it is. The last, you know, five, six, seven, eight games or so, just the start of that second half, they don't have the same level of intensity, and it seems like they always let the opposing team kind of get back into it. And we've seen them fold, but then on – what was it? On <laughs> Monday, on Monday we saw them rise to the occasion, you know, go on that big run and take Colorado out. And that was a far cry from what they did two or three weeks ago against North Carolina when they gave up that huge lead and just kind of um, fell off down the stretch. I just feel like this team is ready for this moment. They've taken the punches all year, and they're ready to respond. So I'm going to go Florida State, 72, Michigan, 65. Whoa. Okay. Two two guys pick FSU. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just here for the fun and the giggles, and I can have fun with friends and enjoy games. But now I'm fully invested after seeing a full energized FSU Malik Osborne. I know Dustin's always been a big fan of his, but to bring that kind of energy, Florida State's going to need it against Michigan. Um, and they showed against Colorado. They're, they're there. Even Balsa was a little fired up, too. Polite was fired up. It's good to see that because you're looking at MJ Walker, who's more of a quiet guy. He's not a big time leader vocal wise, but you know, you want to see Malik Osborne yell, get that energy going. And I think it helps them defensively and it worked very, it's worked well uh, defensively last two week, last two games, but in particular the Colorado game, I thought they looked like they were on a very sharp, I'm going to go Florida state. Um, I think Florida State. I think Florida State is going to get their revenge on Sunday. I think Florida State wins this, though. Uh, I'm going to go Florida State seventy and Michigan sixty nine. And it's not just because it's sixty nine, but I think it is going to be uh, Florida State's going to play good defense. Michigan's going to have a chance at the end, but it's going to be uh, either a it's going to be a takeaway from Scotty Barnes, and he's going to hit a windmill dunk. And that's how the game's going to end. And Florida State's going to be going to the Elite Eight since first time since 2018 when we lost to Michigan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a windmill Which, dunk would be just fine. Uh, like, like Logan said, I'm going to pull a car curve straight and not give a score. But mm. it, that, that 2018 game was that was a really, really good Michigan team. You know, they had three really good players Mo Wagner, Duncan Robinson, Jordan Poole, three NBA guys. Mm-hmm. Had other guys like Charles Matthews. Xavier Simpson is a really talented roster, but Florida State made that game sloppy. Mm-hmm. Just a really sloppy game. I think the final score is 58 54. Mm-hmm. I would not be surprised if it's a similar kind of game. Florida State always has really great defensive game plans, especially in March. 
and wh- whoever, whichever coach gets this defensive assignment, has got a tough task. Obviously, it's not the same system, and I think there's only two players that were on that team, that are on this current team, Isaiah Levers and Austin Davis. But I think it's going to be a really, really sloppy game. That you know, we look at the first half and go, man, what are we watching? This is not college basketball. And then the second half, the team wakes up, hits a couple big shots. Then towards the end, another team comes back. I think it's going to be a two or three point game. So you're going like fifty nine to fifty seven. It's it's yeah, it's going to be down there. I, I, I gotta try to predict you, you know your score. It's not gonna be that low, but it's gonna be down there. <laughs> Sixty. It's gonna be a low one. Sixty two. Something like, like that. that. Yeah, I haven't entirely decided, but it's gonna be somewhere around there. Well, MJ Walker's got to play, you know, defense like he did, you know, against Colorado. He's, oh, he's I mean, everyone be, does. You know, really bad on offense, but you know, I liked what I saw from him. You know, he's definitely just out of it, and he's hurt. But you know, he gutted that one out, taking those charges. I think he took three char- two charges. Three. Three? Like he, he was tough as nails. Yep. Real quick though, who's gonna be Florida State's best player on Sunday? I feel like that's always fun ask giving predictions if, for if these. Florida State wants to win, it's gotta be Scotty Barnes. Mm-hmm. He has Scotty to get Barnes. downhill. It's, uh, it's gotta be him and Raekwon Gray. Uh, I was about to, to say that. I I got Gray and, and Barnes um creating some some trouble, you know, getting with their ability to get to the basket. Those two have to get downhill. And also, I mean, you, you need another guard to have a good performance off the bench, whether it's Anthony Polite again or, you know, whether Calhoun steps up and have a ni- and has a nice game. Just stop dribbling so much, man. It's out, out of control. But <laughs> he's bouncing like this. He, he's, he's, a, dribbling. he's twitchy. I, I, mean, I, I mean, love that. Itchy. But, but, but he had that alley though, man. He's an he had that. When he yeah. hit the alley oop, I think I just broke my hand on the table. I was just I love I love that play. Like I wanted to just, like just, break it down more in the in the article, yeah. my three game changing plays article. Like I know what the plays called, obviously. I love it. It's such a great mm-hmm. play. And yeah. we were always running against two three flex. It, it, we just haven't we no, no one's seen it on film this year because we haven't played a two three team. Uh, like, we okay. didn't get to play Syracuse, so you don't see that play. Now Colorado's like, oh, we're we're in foul trouble. Let's run some zone. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's such and such. I'm not going to say it again, obviously. There's another one where, where Nate got that open three at the top of the key, but he missed it. That's mm-hmm. another two, three beater where, where they oh, just line okay. up three guys across the key and just have a guy step back. Oh, nice. And yeah. I'm going to give me, give me, give me some, you know, obviously I, I agree with those picks too, a gray and definitely Scotty, um, but I'd like to see MJ getting his bag at the three. I'm just feeling, I feel like it's coming and I, I feel like he's, Tuning up here a little bit. I feel like it's coming. I feel like it is. I'm, I'm just going for like a little bold prediction here. I feel like I don't think he. I don't think he has to have a huge game, but I like a surprise guy. I think. I think it could be MJ Walker at the three. Bold prediction. Know. Only one guy finishes in double figures for Florida State. Is it sad that that you're saying MJ Walker is going to be the surprise guy for Florida That's State? Right. Yeah. 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 The, the guy it's who the so front half of the season was, was their best player. But yeah, you know, yep. been banged up. I, I don't see it. I, I, I kind of think he's a little just, bit of rest. I think he's trying a little to bit push of rest. Kind of had some energy there in that last game. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just and, feeling and it. I, I don't know what it is. I was fully against, you know, before the tournament. I, I, I could I be wrong, but I think MJ Walker is a guy who feeds off putting points on, uh, on the board, you know, versus defense. I think, you know, for him to be dialed in, he's got to score. I just don't. Well, I, I don't, don't see think it. so. Hopefully, I probably wouldn't be dialed in if I wasn't scoring. Well, you know Everybody what I'm saying, dickhead. <laughs> 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 oh man! Anything else? Anything else, Austin? I hate Michigan. I think we all. Uh, I've announced on Twitter that I'm banning myself from using the letter M on Twitter. Oh yeah, now the whole Discord is doing the same thing yeah. too. I got Discord. people. The Discord is adding me, saying we need to get on our Twitter and remove the M from the whole game day. <laughs> Can't have it. <laughs> they don't deserve the respect. <laughs> uh, I got too many things to do. All right. Anything else, guys? Anything else? We got a spring scrimmage on Saturday. Second one that me and Dustin will be at. We'll have full coverage inside the Discord. We have a bat cave. If nobody knows what that is, and you're listening to this podcast, we go inside a voice server. The voice room, I should say, inside the Discord. And frankly, I was doing play by play. Then Dustin hopped on and did some play by play kind of stuff there and just gave our own commentary. So uh, if you guys want to join that, it's on our Patreon. 
patreon.com slash no game day and you can connect your discord to that and get in on that and get play by play of what's happening live during the spring scrimmage it was we had yeah. about 30 people in there listening it was rocking so yeah i was gonna say make, make sure you hop on that because i can guarantee there isn't any other florida state media sitting up no. there in the stands with their headphones on giving a live play by play and thoughts That's- on this the scrimmage and this is what you they can had. yeah <laughs> nope you can hear out. you can hear the whistles blowing like coming through and some of the you can hear the coaches yeah you can hear Norvell they can hear Norvell yeah like I mean you're just getting the live raw stuff so I mean get in there sign up as a gold member above and check out that bat cave on Saturday and you know alongside with that um, live coverage of the uh, spring scrimmage also be doing the uh normal text updates like the other other media hey, we're, doing it, we're doing it both ways great job yeah. dustin great job man you know thanks man back to back weekends you're coming up stepping up to the plate man let me just it, pat it, myself it, it, on the back over here for you it's, it's phenomenal man you're gonna reach over here yeah come on uh, nah i'll see you in a couple uh, weeks you can pat yeah, my back yeah, i'll pat oh. you on the back then yeah <laughs> pat him on the back <laughs> nate i can't wait to see y'all together <laughs> uh, but yeah, make sure y'all on the Discord, as always, you can listen to us on iTunes, Google. And shout Play. out to you, Logan, to uh, you know, oh, get, up, get, get up in the morning and oh, I, I can't drink. I can't drink on Friday after, night now. I, I, after drinking Bud Light Seltzer all night, you know, getting <laughs> up and you know, putting but, some work in, man, it, it's just really nice to see you actually like do something, up. you know? Yeah, isn't that nice? You know? Thank God. No. Are you editing this podcast after this? Staying up till one? Are you doing this one, or which one are you doing? Oh, I got next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you 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 take your good rest now. We'll we'll step up the plate for you. Um, but yeah, check out Austin's preview for the game. When's that tomorrow? Thir- um, when's Thursday? Friday? Friday probably. Saturday. Saturday. Oh, I thought you meant the, the game, game, dude. I was like, it's on Sunday. No. What? I usually post no. it twenty four hours before the game. How about you listen to this conversation, Dustin, that you're on? Uh, but yeah, that's practically it. Nate's hey, hey Logan, uh, my wife says that you seem like you're kind of a white collar kind of guy. <laughs> I I don't drink. Uh, Logan like does seltzers. like all the seltzers, dude. No, I do not do that. I'm. I swear every my screen, every dude, time I get on Snapchat, I see you with a different one in your hand. It's I've got to never seen, seen like me. Five, I've never Snapchat. All right, uh, five Dustin's different just, brands by now. Dustin's trying to just embarrass himself. I just put dumb gibberish. stuff on your story, and I'm like, oh, another one. They're not. What, oh, that was a high noon. Get it right. That's different. Yeah, well, I know. Well, vodka's in that. Start with White Claw, then you went to Bud Light Seltzer, and now you're on. <laughs> Freaking high noon. What I'm trying to cut down, Dustin. I'm trying to just like you're doing your cinder blocks. You want to tell us about your cinder blocks workouts that you're doing right now? Nate, you would love this. Tell them about your workout that you're doing, Dustin. I mean, <laughs> I, I, li- I live cinder blocks. <laughs> you know, how's that, how's that feeling in your shoulder? Lift it over your head. Curl it. Do some push-ups on that bitch. There's some other stuff. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh, Jesus. Well, How does it feel on my shoulder, Austin? It it hurts. It's unpleasant. Like it. Yeah, Sounds Austin like just had like hip surgery, and you're still. Hey, congrats, man! You got cleared, Austin. Two and a half months early. Monday was Look a great that. day, man. You, you gonna start hooping? I'm gonna get back into it probably uh, in the next couple of weeks. Break those ankles easily. Ha! Uh, it's easy money. Logan, is there any sport you can't be anyone at? I'm I know, trying man. to figure so, it so, out. So, so I know he's a swimming. terrible good. I know so, he's a so, swimming tennis player. So, so, so you can beat Austin, cross no. him up. You can beat Logan in a race. You can. I can beat you know, the Los. Yeah. You, you, you're just a physical specimen in the gym with your bird chest. Wait, I, I just wait. don't understand it. My bird chest. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, he yeah. said, dude, I swear on Saturday, he said something like he can run Jamie Robinson over. No. Nah. Oh, no, you that, said no. you said something like that. I was like, no, what are you talking no, about? No. <laughs> Depends though on the day. Depends on how much I ate the day before. That's all I'll say. Not now. Oh, God. Don't put that out there. Don't put that out there. I'll have someone <laughs> tweet me with a clip of that tagging him. Uh, but yeah, everybody enjoy the rest of y'all's week. Enjoy the weekend. Also, Jameis just signed with the Saints. They got the contract signed just a little bit ago. So congrats to old J Boo wins, future starter for the Saints. That's a great interview with Brent McFadden. If you haven't watched it, I need to go back and li- I need to go listen to it now. But uh, yeah, y'all have a great rest of y'all's week. We will talk to you guys on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday in the Batcave. <laughs> exactly. I, we don't. I, I don't know what schedule we're on now. Too much basketball going on. All right, adios. See ya.
Mama told me not to sell work.